Hello, and welcome to the library's virtual lecture at the forefront of COVID-19 knowledge, you Chicago Medicine and the library work together. My name is Amber Cullen and I am the library's director of development. Before we begin, I will make a few brief comments. I will then introduce Brenda Johnson who will introduce our speakers. Only our speakers will be on screen for this event. However, we would like you to participate by asking questions. To do that, type a question in the Q&A box at any time during the talk. Please do not use the chat box to enter your questions. If you have issues with audio, you may want to shut down programs running in the background or dial in from your telephone. The presentation will last about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions from you. This webinar is being recorded and we will make it available to you online. Now, I'm pleased to welcome Brenda Johnson, Library Director and University Librarian to introduce our featured speakers. Thank you for joining us everyone tonight. We welcome you to this second virtual lecture in our RAG at 50 series. This series is designed to act as a window into the past, the present, and the future of the Joseph Regenstein Library and our full library system. In the fall, we began by welcoming Dean John Boyer and Dean Ann Robertson to discuss Regenstein's past. Tonight, we look to the library systems um, present in our current pandemic moment. Much of the work of librarians across our library system is being done online and in virtual spaces, such as the one we are uh, sharing tonight. To explain one aspect of the important role the library plays in the current world situation in collaboration with U Chicago Medicine, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our featured speakers. First, Dr. Vinette Aurora is a Herbert T. Abelson Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago Medicine. As Associate Chief Medical Officer for the Clinical Learning Environment, she bridges education and clinical leadership to improve the learning environment for medical trainees and the quality, safety, and experience of care delivered to hospitalized adults. An accomplished researcher, Dr. Aurora has served as a principal investigator on numerous federal and foundation research grants. Her academic work has resulted in dozens of peer reviewed publications and has been recognized with awards from many societies such as the Society of Hospital Medicine or the Association of Program Directors of Internal Medicine. She has also testified to Congress on the primary care crisis, as well as to the Institute of Medicine. For her work, she's received many accolades, including being recognized as one of 20 people who made healthcare better by Health Leaders Magazine in 2011. Dr. Mackie Collison is a third year infectious disease fellow and clinical instructor at University of Chicago, specializing in hospital epidemiology and infection prevention. She has had the opportunity to be a part of the COVID-19 response at the university, working with both the infectious disease section on clinical care of patients and a part of the infection prevention team. She has a particular interest in the transmission of infectious disease in both the hospital and community, as well as quality improvement work to prevent hospital acquired infections. Deb Werner is Director of Library Research and Medical Education at the John Carrara Library. In this role, she provides research support and formal instruction to members of the biomedical community, including students, faculty, clinicians, and researchers in the Biological Sciences Division, Pritzker School of Medicine, and the college. She manages the library's collection in medicine, supports systematic reviews, rounds, with a University of Chicago Medicine's general internal medicine team and is a member of the Pritzker School of Medicine Curriculum Steering Committee. And Caitlin Van Campen is the Kathleen A. Czar Clinical Library Resident at the Carrar Library. As a clinical librarian, she works closely with clin clinical staff at UChicago Medicine by attending rounds and providing point of need services and information support assisting them with clinical questions that arise. 
She works with the broader University of Chicago Health Sciences community, providing research support, collaborating with faculty and students at Pritzker School of Medicine, and offering instruction on using biomedical databases and tools, and developing research strategies for retrieving high quality evidence. I warmly welcome all our speakers and thank you for your presentations this evening. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Aurora. Thank you so much uh, for um, the introduction, Brenda, and it's uh, lovely to be here with all of you. Um, I wanted to um, set the stage uh, for um, really why, um, why we think this work is um, so important by taking you back in time to almost a year ago now um, when our hospital was facing that first surge of the unknown with COVID patients coming in. Um, and before I do that, I wanted to share a little bit about why we started the embedded clinical librarian service that you heard a little bit about um, that our librarians rotate on. And so um, as many of you know, um, doctors work very long hours. Um, and one of the ways in which they transition the care of patients and achieve a common shared model of learning about a patient and their diagnosis is through rounding. And so um, groups of doctors gather um, sometimes with other disciplines like nurses and social workers and case managers and round together to see patients. Um, and that's really how we train residents and, and students in our organization. Um, one of the um, interesting things that um, I've had the fortunate pleasure of working with Deb on for many years is the embedded clinical librarian service where we were able to work with Deb to embed her into medicine and pediatric rounds once a week. And what we showed with that embedding is that by having her actually uh, go on rounds and do some coaching around clinical questions, we were able to boost the educational learning of our learners on rounds, which was great, especially when we think about how much other stuff the, the clinical care team is doing. Um, and so they were, gonna add, they were able to ask good questions. Those questions actually translated into patient care improvements, and they were not more inefficient. And so we measured the time that it actually took to do this. And it turned out that rounds were not longer. And so the great news is rounds were more educational. They had more patient content. Um, the patients felt better, about, uh, the pa you know, patients were getting better care, but we didn't make the rounds longer. And that was a real key um, thing that we wanted to do. And so what's interesting to me is that with this, we actually worked on a proposal to, um, to actually recruit Caitlin as the um, as the Kathleen Czar librarian resident um, and expand those embedded clinical librarian rounds to more services. And so we don't just have medicine and pediatrics in our hospital, but we have neurology, uh, we have hospitalists uh, which, who don't, who care for patients without residents. Um, and then we also have surgeons. And so we thought, well, what if we were able to think about embedding librarians on all of these services. And so with Caitlin's uh, arrival, uh, we were able to launch some of that work um, and actually have her work with the neurology rounds um, as well as support surgeons through like a pop-up rounds and help them with their conferences. Um, since obviously a lot of the surgery residents, we weren't gonna be able to round with them in the operating room, but we could still round with them in the workroom. Um, so that was the stage in January of 2020. We were really, um, I would say, on the cutting edge, just launching some of these new embedded librarian services on some of these new teams when, um, in fact, um, you know, then as we were approaching March, um, we realized that uh, very quickly, I would say Dr. Landon, Dr. Collison's team, uh, Dr. Landon's one of Dr. Collison's mentors um, was, you know, sounding an alarm. We needed to socially distance in the hospital. And I remember the weeks in which she was telling us we needed to socially distance. And she's like, this is the last meeting we're going to have in person. We can't have meetings like this anymore. Um, and you know that we were in still internalizing this and going home and seeing that you know the street and everyone was around. And it was a really tough time for a lot of healthcare workers to really understand what was about to happen in the hospital, but know that others didn't quite understand. And so what ended up happening is um, pretty quickly that third week of March, we realized that we were going to need to pull um, 
Caitlin and Deb out of rounding um, and that we were going to need to pull them back until further notice until we understood what was happening. Um, the other thing that we realized is that, um, the, you know, the social with the social distancing, and this was before we knew to even wear masks. Um, we knew that we had to be six feet away. And because of um, how cramped the hospital is with workrooms and things, we didn't even have enough space for our learners. Um, and so I remember devoting a lot of my time to redesigning resident workrooms, like where were we literally gonna house people and put people with computers. And I was on the phone with facilities and resources a lot of the times trying to figure out where we were gonna house people so that they could continue doing their work. Um, uh, and I remember we also had third year medical students and fourth year medical students that were rotating. And then this was the last concern, which was the concern about PPE. And so, um, you know, I will say University of Chicago has been on the forefront of having PPE and at no time have I felt that we did not have PPE. But in this uncertain phase, when we weren't sure what was happening, we were and we didn't know how much PPE would need. Uh, we were concerned that perhaps the medical students, um, you know, are there for learning, you know, would they be, you know, using PPE, would they somehow be put in a situation where they could get sick. You know, that's a pretty difficult situation for us to really put our students in at the time because of the great unknown. So on the Sunday, the Sunday around, uh, you know, right around St. Patrick's Day, I remember a communication to make the difficult decision to pull the medical students off the rotation um, until further notice, until we, we had a greater um, clarity of what was happening. And so when I think back to those days, um, I, and I think about now, I know that um, we have so much greater knowledge that we've gained about COVID and a lot of um, less anxiety, of course, about treating COVID patients that we did at that time. The next thing that happened was that working with colleagues for, like at University of Washington, we're, who were a few weeks ahead of us for the pandemic, we realized that we needed to quickly move to a plan where we were isolating patients with COVID um, into a unit. And that was gonna protect um, the spread of um, COVID among healthcare workers and among patients. And the reason that was important is again, we weren't sure about the PPE. We weren't sure what was needed. Uh, we didn't, you know, the studies hadn't been done. And so um, right around that time, you know, around that third week of March after we pulled the students, we started to actually then re- um, organized care in the hospital where we concentrated, made the decision to concentrate all of the COVID patients onto what we call COVID units. Um, and so we took regular medical surgery units where they had a lot of patients, emptied them out, moved those patients elsewhere, and started to actually um, seal them off with plant and others um, and negative pressure, make sure that everybody had the right masks and turn them into COVID units. Um, we were able to staff those COVID units with nurses and um, residents and hospitalists and anesthesiologists and a variety of other clinicians, uh, respiratory therapists. But one major challenge occurred with that. Um, so the good news about COVID units is, you know, a lot of hospitals used COVID units and they help to, um, you know, diminish spread. But they also really led to a lot of concentrated, um, you know, um, admissions about COVID all on the same clinicians, especially the nurses and the physicians. And so what we saw was that people were learning, you know, the amount of learning that needed to take place, literally from putting on your PPE to answering a question about a COVID patient and whether or not to give them a certain medication or not, it was so difficult to know the answer to at the time. And there was a lot of confusion about what the right answers were at the time. And then the other thing we saw was that um, a lot of the clinicians did report burning out. Um, they were felt that they had to internalize all of the difficult COVID patients challenges. And I know many of you have probably seen the news where um, you know we have had many patients die. Uh, much fewer patients are dying now, which is so much better. Uh, we've just passed that grim milestone of 500,000 deaths. And several of those uh, deaths took place at the University of Chicago um, when family could not be at the bedside. And the healthcare worker was literally the last person to hold somebody's hand 
percent, and that just took an incredible toll on our frontline healthcare workers. And so, really, I'm describing the milieu of really where we were at the time, which is we had these COVID units, we had. Um, rapidly evolving knowledge about um, about things we didn't even know at the time. Uh, we had a workforce that needed help um, and that was you know trying to figure out how to look things up but but it was getting to be very difficult. And then we had medical students who in the middle of their curriculum, in the middle of their courses were pulled off the rotations and were basically sent um, home. And some of them actually did manage to get home and uh, got to their uh, families and um, stayed there. Uh, but we needed to really think about, well, how are we gonna continue medical training in this very challenging time uh, with the students, um, as well as supporting the frontline clinicians who are caring for COVID patients. So I will uh, pause there and um, just leave you with the fact that um, oftentimes in a time of great challenge emerges great opportunity. And I'm a big believer in really utilizing and thinking about those opportunities, particularly with diverse teams. And so I was really grateful to be able to approach um, um, Deb and Maggie and Caitlin and say, what can we do here? And so um, one of the uh, great things um, that happened was one of the people that I work for, Dr. Stephen Weber, who's a chief medical officer at our hospital um, said, you know, we need to do something to help the teams learn, uh, what can we do? And I was also working in the medical school as somebody who works in both spheres, the hospital and the medical school. And one of the deans there said, what, what are we gonna do to keep our medical students you know, training and keep, it, keep on going? And so we saw an opportunity. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to Caitlin next. Hello, um, good evening everyone. Um, as Dr. Rora said, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're really excited um, to get to kind of share the work that our team um, did this past spring and will hopefully be able to continue um, doing, which you'll hear about later on. Um, so just to kind of reiterate what Dr. Aurora just explains, back in March, we were really beginning uh, to see how widespread and severe the pandemic was. The hospital had scaled back, um, everyone who was on site, so that meant both Deb and myself, along with all the medical students, uh, were pulled from these rounds. Um, so I kind of want to touch back on both how Deb and myself as clinical librarians were having to pivot our work um, back in March and also how we got involved with the team. So kind of giving the spin from the university librarian side, um, so kind of opposite of what Dr. Aurora just did. Um, so as medical librarians, an important part of our role um, is to participate in these patient rounds and be part of the clinical team. And as Dr. Aurora just explained, I actually very recently um, started this role. So just prior to the pandemic in January of 2020, I had just been hired um, to University of Chicago. And so I was very new to the five teams that I was rounding with. So I was rounding every day um, in the hospital with five different teams. So I was really just beginning to get to form a relationship with them when COVID kind of came in and disrupted that. Um, and part of being a clinical librarian, uh, part of that role is really getting the team to utilize you. Um, not many people know what a clinical librarian is. They're not as common. Um, they are getting more common, but they're not a very common role. Um, so a lot of clinicians haven't worked with them. So um, being part of this role, you do have to uh, be a little bit um, outgoing and, and get them to see how we can be useful. Um, and that really does take building a relationship with these teams. Um, and this is much easier to do when you are physically in person and in the room with the team and they can see you and know to think that they should ask you questions or we can be there and really help them um, know when they are actually asking a clinical question that we can help with. Um, so it was really important for me when I was pulled away and working virtually to be able to continue building this relationship. So um, with both Deb and I being pulled from our person, our, our um, in-team person, um, we really wanted to find a way to be able to support and um, give them those information needs and help them um, during this infodemic, as we like to call it. There was so much information coming out about COVID-19, so we really needed to find a way that we could continue to support our clinicians while we were working virtually. 
So Deb and I began um, brainstorming a couple different ideas and things um, for us to do, especially for me now that my schedule was going to be much more open now that I wasn't spending half my day in the hospital um, and different ways that we could, you know, assist these clinicians. So one of the things Deb suggested was that I create a LibGuide for COVID-19. Um, so LibGuides are kind of like a website um, and you can have a lot of different resources on a topic compiled into one place. Typically, they're going to be organized with like tabs and sections, um, so you can have kind of different subtopics within um, this guide, and you can link to different things like things within um, like the library catalog, so books or journals that we have. You can also have links for websites, you can embed videos, um, you can do a lot of different things with these web guides. So um, I actually created one for COVID that would have some general information on COVID, so this would be local information, you know, on um, what was going on in Chicago or national information, and then we also also embedded some videos on like hand washing, um, social distancing, but really wanted to have just general information for the public. Um, and then as Dr. Aurora just described, the clinicians were really experiencing burnout. So I also wanted to create a space on this guide that they could access uh, a lot of different COVID-19 resources and information. Um, so I did create then a second tab on this page that was specifically for clinicians. So on this page, I had things like links to the CDC, the World Health Organization, um, and then I had links for different medical journals, um, and they had different COVID centers on there. So it was all of the COVID information being published by these journals all in one place. So the intention with this guide was really to have a place that clinicians could go and quickly access COVID materials without them having to you know, search too much um, on their own. And really, hopefully, we were going to reduce some of the stress for them. And shortly after I created this, um, right around that mid-March period, uh, Dr. Aurora reached out to Deb and myself to see if we could work with an infectious disease fellow, Dr. Collison, um, on finding and organizing some different COVID-19 articles. Um, and the idea with this was that Dr. Collison would then be able to distribute these articles to those clinicians who are working in those COVID um, cohorts that Dr. Aurora described. And then I would actually be able to take these lists of journals and articles and add them onto that guide as well so that they could have them kind of centrally located. So Dr. Collison and I met and we created a list of journals that we thought would be most pertinent for this. So these included a lot of infectious disease journals and hospital society journals and just the journals that we thought would be the most impactful for this. Uh, we also went and created some search strategies on PubMed so that we could be continuously pulling new articles. So PubMed, if you're unfamiliar, it is a biomedical database that has millions of citations on it. And there are different features on PubMed that you can use as a researcher that really um, are there to help the researcher. And one of these is that you can save a search strategy, which is a like string of terms that you can enter in and it should ideally bring back articles that match. Um, so you can save one of these search strategies and it will then email you results anytime a new article is added onto the database that fits into your search string. So we made um, some strategies for five of the biggest medical journals that we thought would um, apply to this and then also for different specializations. Um, so I did some for the teams that I rounded with like neurology, um, surgery. Um, I also round with mother baby so that we did some like pregnancy and COVID-19 because there's a lot of questions about that going on. Um, and then Deb and I also committed to working to help answer some clinical questions regarding COVID-19. So similar to what we were doing with our clinical teams before and helping them find resources and things that would answer these clinical questions and do literature reviews on them. Um, however, as Dr. Aurora described, there was so much information going and coming out at the time that Deb and I pretty quickly realized we were going to need um, assistance because there was just so much information and the demand for um, questions and everything just kept on increasing as the um, time went on. So Dr. Aurora then suggested that we might want to recruit some fourth year medical students um, to help summarize and synthesize. As she said, the, the medical school was asking her different ways um, that students could come in and be utilized. So this was really helpful for those students in getting back into that clinical interaction and that clinical space, um, even though they were remote, they were working from home as well. Um, and this was going to be helpful for us as librarians because it would help alleviate some of that um, stress that we were then getting with you know this information overload and it would help those clinicians in being able to have, um, you know synthesized information much easier to, to take in than an entire article. Um, so in about mid end of March, we recruited uh, four fourth year medical students and then an intern and we officially created the U Chicago education support team for COVID-19. 
So this team of nine of us worked from about the last few weeks of March through the end of April, and we really had to hit the ground running and quickly create a system that would help us to support the demand of the clinicians with um, all their information needs and these increasing levels of information and articles and research that was coming out about um, COVID. So Dr. Aurora helped us out by setting up an email alias for us. So this was an email that any time a clinician would send something in, it would then get forwarded to everybody in the group, but they just had to, you know, send it to one email, which made it easier for them. And then I went and set up a box folder where we could all access um, the documentation from home that we were working on. So if you're unfamiliar with box, it's similar to Google Docs. Um, you can have like Word documents, Excel, documents and spreadsheets, you can have a bunch of different documents um, all in one folder and you can all work on it remotely. So we were able to work from our places wherever we were and a lot of times we were working on the same documents um, and questions and things all at the same time. So I could be on it, Deb could be on it, all of our students could be on it. It just made it really easy um, for us all to work on it as a team. And then our team also was meeting weekly via Zoom to check in. We would go over the work that had already been done for the week, so any questions we had answered um, and what questions we still had to answer. And then this was really just to keep our team on the same page. This was also a great time for our students to be asking us questions as this was a learning environment for them as well. And it was a good time for us to get feedback and um, reflect as a team on what was working and what we might need to change. Um, so after some trial and error, we were able to figure out a workflow that served our team best. In general, what we had happen was the librarians would take the question and search for some literature and then our students would summarize and synthesize the articles um, into an answer based off of those. Um, articles that they read. So typically how it would work, a clinician would send a question to that team email, and then I would go in and check to see if it was a question that we had already answered. We did receive a few duplicate questions. Um, so if it was something that was already answered, I would look to see how recently we had answered that question. If it was something we had just done, I would typically forward them the answer um, that we had come up with. But if it was something even a week prior, um, I would actually have our team updated because information was just coming out so rapidly. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were getting the most up-to-date information. So I would then um, take that question and I would post it onto a document that our team had on Box of a, that was an ongoing list of the questions that we had. And this way, everyone on the team could see the question and who was working on it. So on this document, we would put the question and then we would have a space for which librarian was working on it. Um, and then there was a space that the students could claim the question. And then we would eventually put on uh, what resources we used and the um, synthesized answer. So I would then alert the team that there was a new question that we needed to work on or update. And then Deb and myself would decide who was going to do the literature search for it. While we were working on finding um, articles, one of the students would then go on and claim the question by just putting their initials on it. Um, and since it was a shared document, everyone could see that the question was already claimed. Then Deb and I would typically um, send the articles to whichever student had claimed it. Most of the time we'd have about three to five articles, depending on the complexity of the question and how much information had um, been produced and released about um, the question that was being asked. Uh, sometimes there wasn't really any information at all. Um, COVID was very new, so there was, you know, a lot of things that we didn't know about it. So sometimes there would be journal articles that had been posted. Sometimes we would have to use a preprint article, um, which Deb will go over in a little bit what that is. But just depending on the question, we either would have a lot of information or very little. So um, that really did factor into our team as well. So the students uh, would then take those articles that we had given them and they would read them and then they would write a summary for each individual article. And then they would write a synthesized answer that took all of those different articles and put them into um, yeah, one, one answer. Sometimes the students wouldn't find um, any conclusive information within the articles that we had given them. Um, so sometimes they might have to do some searching on their own. So that was also a great opportunity for them to start getting some of that searching um, skills as well. Um, so once the students had written that synthesis, they would then send that on to me and I would go through and review it. Um, 
just to make sure that it, it worked with the question that was asked, and I would send it on then to the clinician who asked. Uh, the students would then post those article summaries that they did into a document that we had on box. Um, and this document was broken down into sections and topics so that we could keep kind of all of the articles we had organized in one place. Um, in addition to summarizing literature for the clinical questions, the students were also monitoring um, literature on COVID-19 that was notable or of specific interest to them, but hadn't yet been asked in a question. So some of these, um, we had one student who was interested in the racial disparity that was going on. So certain communities were being um, more impacted by COVID than others. And we also had students working on neurological manifestations. Um, so, you know, what, what was it doing um, with, you know, the brain or different things like that. Um, they actually were looking at the anosmia. So the, the lack of taste and smell. Um, before we were even asked a question about that, one of our students was really interested in finding that. Um, so they were, you know, even looking at a lot of this information before we were even being asked about it. Um, so they would also write summaries on those articles and then post that to that document too. This was really useful actually because inevitably we would be asked questions about this information that they were looking up. Um, and they had already found some of these resources on this. So this was great. It would cut down some of our research time and also some of the synthesis time um, with them staying on top of these important and newer topics that were coming out. And this also kept the students really involved during slower weeks when we might not have enough questions for all of them. Um, they were able to you know, continue working and continue um, helping out the team this way. And the students actually also took it upon themselves to review some of the questions that they had been asked previously for any new information that could change or enhance their answers um, that we had already written and given out. Um, so as we know, a lot of the information was changing pretty rapidly. So this happened a little bit more like towards the end of this first cohort in the end of April that they started looking back and reviewing some of the questions. Um, but as I said, some of the questions, we didn't really have any literature when it was first asked. So they were able to go back and give a more in-depth answer once we had more research that was um, produced and out about it. And as everyone knows, information was changing very rapidly. So we really wanted to make sure our clinicians were working with answers and resources that were the most up-to-date. Um, so back to those different documents that we worked on for on box, um, we had that article summaries one that was broken up into um, the different topics, but we also had one that I created that was the different questions and syntheses. So um, I took all of those, I put the question, the answer, and then the resources, and I organized it into a new document that was a little bit cleaner and easier to read, and was also broken up into different subsections and topics. And then we actually linked these to that COVID guide that I had created um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And this way, anyone would be able to go in since that is a public um, link, they could go in and they could view the questions that we had already um, been asked and answered. And they could also be able to view these succinct summaries of this notable literature on COVID-19. And we actually shared this guide then with those in the medical center and we kind of used it as our team's website. So it was really helpful that we already had, um, you know, this, this guide kind of started and we could really build off of it and make it more robust. Um, and this was a public facing guide. So um, anyone could go ahead and refer back to it and see what our team was working on. And then Dr. Aurora actually then was also working with the hospital administration um, to make sure that our team's email and that website that we had were pushed out regularly um, to the hospital staff so that they could uh, get assistance in the clinical um, information and everything that they were looking for. So there was a COVID update email that went out daily um, and we had like a little footnote that our team email and website was in. Um, and this really did help to get our team um, to have some more attention and also allowed for us to have a really steady stream of questions and really helped that first cohort be really successful. And actually due to how successful this first group was, we were able to turn it into an elective uh, for the medical school for the month of May. So I'm going to hand it over to Deb now, who's going to talk a little bit more about that process and how that worked and what different changes we had to make within our team um, for this to become an elective. Thank you, Caitlin, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to echo Caitlin and uh, Dr. Aurora's sentiments. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you all about this project. Um, so as Caitlin said, I'm going to discuss how the COVID-19 educational support team was transformed into a formal elective um, in the Pritzker School of Medicine's curriculum to fill that need for additional training opportunities that Dr. Aurora described earlier. But before I talk about that um, process, like Dr. Aurora, I'd like to take us back to early 2020, this time to remind ourselves what was happening specifically at the university at that time. 
so on March 12th, the university, the university community learned that spring quarter for college students would be 100% online, and that for now, the university and the medical center would remain open. The following day on March 13th, we were informed that with the approval of managers and unit directors, employees may work remotely where possible. On that same day, the medical center sent out a communication informing the campus community that one of their patients had tested positive for COVID-19. On March 16th, it was announced that the spring quarter would be delayed by one week and therefore shortened from 10 weeks to nine. On that same day, the Pritzker School of Medicine's Curriculum Steering Committee held an emergency online vote on changes to the curriculum to ensure the safety of students and patients and to preserve the student's educational experience. Then on March 17th, the following day, Governor Pritzker issued a directive prohibiting gatherings of more than 50 people and the university responded by having their dining halls switched from dine-in services to grab-and-go options. The Ratner Center and Henry Crown Field House were also closed through April 5th, or so they thought at the time. On March 18th, it was announced that the libraries would be closed for two weeks. Again, that's what we thought it would be. We thought it would be a two-week closure. And then on March 20th, Governor Pritzker issued a statewide stay-at-home order. So with that, I hope I've brought us back to that time when things were changing very rapidly as more became known about the severity of the coronavirus. So it's in that context that I describe the transformation of the COVID-19 educational support team into a medical school elective, which had to be approved by the Pritzker School of Medicine's Curriculum Steering Committee. So to give you some background on this group, um, the Curriculum Steering Committee is charged with providing oversight and management of the medical school's curriculum, including among other responsibilities, approving or rejecting curricular changes related to existing or new courses, clerkships, or elective offerings. This committee is chaired by the Associate Dean for Evaluation and Continuous Quality Improvement and consists of 18 to 20 faculty across the Basic Sciences Department and the clinical departments and includes course directors and clerkship directors. It has four to five staff members from the medical school and three fourth year medical, uh, medical students who have been elected co-presidents of their class and are known as the Pritzker Chiefs. And I serve on the committee as the library representative. So after having already made some changes to the medical, medical school curriculum in March, the curriculum steering committee met virtually on April 8th and discussed this proposed four week elective among other items on the agenda. So based on our experience with the initial educational support team cohort of students and the valuable feedback that they provided, we formalized tasks to inc incorporate additional structure and we added group meetings and students were in the elective given the responsibility of searching for articles. I think Caitlin had mentioned um, in her portion how she and I were doing uh, the searching and then we brought on students for the summarizing and so forth. Um, but earlier on prior to the um, elective, Caitlin and I were, were doing all the searching. So the elective was approved and it began then in May. It was fully subscribed with 10 new students who were rising fourth years. Um, these new students were paired with students from the previous cohort to learn how to synthesize and summarize the articles and they were assigned different roles each week, either searching the literature to answer new questions, synthesizing the articles that were found, or updating answers to previous questions as new information was made available. Caitlin and I provided formal instruction sessions using questions that were submitted as our examples to teach the students how to find articles in PubMed and how to use preprint servers such as MedArchive. And Caitlin briefly mentioned preprints um, earlier, and I'll talk about those now. So if, if you're not familiar with preprints, these are articles that have not undergone the peer review process in which experts in the field review a manuscript prior to publication to um, provide feedback to authors and journal editors regarding any issues, any cause for concern, as well as suggested improvements to the article. This is a time consuming but valuable process However, the situation was changing so rapidly in those early months, preprints were sometimes the only source of information available to us. 
Um, so when we used preprints to answer questions, the students would note that the article was a preprint. It had not undergone peer review, which is a really important notation. Uh, they would also carefully critically appraise the preprint and look for any other potential errors or other issues. And I'll note here that preprints are used in other disciplines um, outside of medicine with some regularity, but for medicine, they have not traditionally been used, um, used widely. So this was a big shift uh, even in, you know, in the profession to begin relying on preprints um, for clinical decisions. So the students that assigned to updating the previous answers would need to check the status of any preprints that had been used to see whether they had been formally published. And if they had to reread it because there are a lot of changes often from the initial um, preprint, which is some, something of an early draft of the article to then when it's actually published, there can be a lot of changes. Um, so maybe it had been formally published, maybe it had been withdrawn. Um, or whether other articles, actual peer-reviewed articles, if they had been corrected in some way or retracted. Retraction is usually a pretty um, rare occurrence, but we saw a higher uptick of that in the early days of publishing in COVID. So these students were surveyed at the end of the elective and they were very positive about their experience. They also provided very useful suggestions for improvement. So they suggested that we provide additional didactic sessions and that the students, uh, the student who performed the literature search was the one who performed the synthesis and summary, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but we had not done that in order to more equally distribute the work as the number of questions varied from week to week. However, the students felt that ownership of a question from the literature search to the summary was more important than the careful balancing of the workload and that we could um, adjust the workload in other areas, but let a student really have ownership of the question uh, from beginning to end. So I'm really pleased to announce that we have further expanded the uh, COVID-19 elective to the new ASAP or Ask, Search, Appraise, Perform virtual elective in evidence-based practice for fourth year students at Pritzker and for uh, virtual visiting students as well. In the ASAP elective, students will field questions on topics beyond COVID-19. The questions will still come from clinicians caring for patients at the medical center, however. We have three new faculty advisors for this elective, Drs. Edwin, uh, Edwin Rosas, uh, Aska Afsal, and Felicia D'Souza. We will keep a similar format, but provide even more structure as the, was the feedback that we'd received from the students in the first elective. The four week ASAP curriculum features small group, uh, small group workshops to practice searching strategies, refining questions and applying evidence to patient care. Students will be paired with a faculty mentor and additional faculty be, will be recruited if that's needed. More didactic sessions will take place on appraising and applying evidence from prognostic studies, studies about diagnostic, diagnostic tests, as well as on the efficacy and safety of therapeutic studies. Students will also have the opportunity to attend clinical case conferences from different specialties in which an actual patient's condition, diagnosis, and treatment plan are discussed in depth. And we look forward to our first cohort in the ASAP curriculum. I will now turn it over to Dr. Collison, who will speak about the impact of our work. Thank you. And um, I just want to say good evening, everybody. And I'm so excited to both be here and then have been a part of this team um, starting last year in January, or you know, when all of this kind of started to change. Um, I'm actually one of the infectious disease fellows. I'm a third year infectious disease fellow, and I happen to be already interested in infection prevention. So just to kind of give you a background of my role at that point, kind of back in March was I was still finishing up my clinical training. Um, where I was, you know, focusing on seeing patients on a regular basis. And so those patients that were going to be admitted or started to be admitted with COVID, we were, our teams were very involved with guiding other doctors on, you know, what therapeutics might be worthwhile to try. And we really were not, not sure on a lot of that. Um, in addition, I have the opportunity to work with our hospital epidemiology team and infection prevention team. So with that team, is composed of a variety of both clinicians um, as well as people with microbiology backgrounds. And they basically make the policies for the hospital in order to try to prevent spread of disease. So, you know, typically we, we are doing that anyways, but then with this pandemic, that was an even bigger 
a bigger challenge because there was this new virus that was we were really worried about both our healthcare workers and our patients and we wanted to prevent it from spreading within the hospital um, so i just wanted to kind of reiterate what was said before was that a lot of this anxiety um, and a kind of constant stream of data constantly having to make decisions on not having enough information um, individual level patient care was really challenging and then making decisions for a hospital wide keeping everybody safe was also challenging and and actually, the first time I met with Caitlin, I just felt like I could breathe a sigh of relief because we, you know, she was right on board, ready to go and ready to support clinicians in the hospital with whatever information they may need. And as things progressed, I think that this service really had such a huge impact for both individual patient care and also even beyond to providing and information for the community as well. Um, also, just to give you a little bit of background with an with a, a disease that we're more familiar with, we have societies. Um, the Infectious Disease Society of America is, is one that we turn to a lot of times as physicians. We look at guidelines um, to be able to make sure we're, we're following the best practices. Of course, with this new disease, we didn't have any of that available. So I know myself and my colleagues, we were constantly in that situation. Um, so I just want to take a couple minutes to describe the impact this team had on a broad hospital and community level. Um, just to give you a few numbers, we actually had 22 individual cl clinicians send questions. Um, I would say this is probably even a greater number of people actually asking the questions. I know I would email questions on behalf of my colleagues um, based on patients they had seen or on decisions they had to come up with for hospital-wide policies. Our team was asked over over 90 questions and then ended up with 80 unique syntheses because some of those were duplicate questions, but basically 80 unique question and syntheses were published. And they summarized 325 articles, which is really, really very remarkable. And I can tell you as somebody who read a number of those summaries, that just made it made me feel more confident when I was able to care for patients or talk to a colleague about a new policy that we were developing um, knowing that we had some background or knowing if we didn't have any information right now was really, really crucial. I want to share just a couple of highlights of, of this, and I'm just going to share my screen briefly. And um, Caitlin had made this for one of her posters, just goes over a lot of the clinical question categories. And you can just see the main thing is that the just we were able, or this team was able to answer so many questions across the board. And I think this was really crucial because we reached out to people that were in pediatrics, people in obstetrics, questions um, about follow-up and long-term effects, which continues to be an area of intensive research, um, infection prevention, like I mentioned, and then really like across all the organ systems, like we were saying we have doctors from across from the heart doctors to the lung doctors to the um, neurology or brain doctors, like everybody had questions in different areas. Um, and then the next one I wanted to share with you was just that there was a survey done at the end of those who utilize this resource. And as you can see in the first two columns, they talked about the satisfaction with the synthesis. Everybody would strongly agree or agree and that the synthesis answered my question. Um, and then they also, many people also thought that the synthesis resulted in a change in thinking and maybe a change in ability to make a decision more confidently. Um, and then finally, I think the most important, and this is I've gotten anecdotally from some of my colleagues as well, saying that a literature searching and synthesis service like this would be useful moving forward even when the pandemic ends. So I think that just speaks to the immense impact that this team has had in, in um, individual care and in the community. I wanted to just give a couple examples of questions because I was reviewing some of this and I thought it was very interesting that that really a lot of these questions are still unanswered and there continues to be constant data. So it just kind of shows that that this group, that this service was really ahead in trying to answer some of these questions and get us the most up to date and accurate information. Um, and so one of the questions that was asked way back in June was what is the latest understanding of the viability and effectivity of long term viral shedding of COVID? And this is something that really honestly comes up for me almost on a daily basis amongst our team because we, we do really worry about making sure, um, you know, we're not transmitting anything within the hospital. Uh, and so actually, even within the last couple of weeks, the CDC has had to make some 
slight adjustments um, based on new data for people that maybe have a lower immune system. Um, and even earlier on, they had actually, I felt more confident in telling people they could stop some isolation or like having a patient on a precaution where you wear where you wear an extra like face shield or mask in the room um, with the patient. And we were able to kind of like tell people more confidently that we had a lot of information based on the syntheses that had been done by the library team and the students. Um, and then just like even more recently on an individual patient level, um, basically there are some medications that have been studied throughout this pandemic. And we were even, this was a constant decision we were having to make with our colleagues about whether or not, you know, some of these medications that can lower the immune system would actually be helpful for this kind of disease. And it was really hard to be able to, to know if you were really giving everybody the right, the right thing at that time. And so they answered this question back in June for us. And then even just this last week, that question is still, finally, there's more trial data coming in on that information. So about a year later, but if we hadn't had the, the usefulness of this service that we wouldn't have even had that ability to put the data that was available together. Um, so I think just uh, very briefly also, the other main thing that has come out of this has been uh, a number of both papers related directly to this work, um, but also just you know looking at, they help to give literature background reviews for a number of studies that were done later um, and that are ongoing right now, um, as well as um, Caitlin had put together um, multiple posters, including uh, getting at one of the top three posters at the Quality and Safety Symposium, um, as well as the MLA Association Annual Conference. Um, in addition to that, um, we've been working with the American Medical Association, as well as the Society of Hospital Medicine um, Converge Conference. So just kind of shows that this type of service, I think, will continue to be utilized, and we can continue to share this work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Aurora, Dr. Collison, Deb, and Caitlin for sharing and explaining with us this really important uh, partnership between UChicago Medicine and the library. So we've reached this part in the program where we're going to open it up for questions. And just a reminder that if you do have a question, we ask that you put it in the Q&A box. So while we're uh, waiting for folks to warm up to that, we already have a question that has come in. And that is uh, wanting to know, and I think maybe Caitlin, this might be for you, um, whether the lib guides have been shared much with other hospitals or medical schools or libraries. Could you take that one? Absolutely. Um, so yes, actually this uh, library guide, um, back right when I had first done it, um, uh, we had, I think one librarian from a school on the East Coast um, had sent me an email asking if they could copy it. So LibGuides actually has the ability that you can take someone's guide and directly copy it onto your own guide. Um, so there is a school out there who basically has my guide on their website. Um, so we did have a couple different schools actually reach out to us about information and then um, we had some hospitals um, who were interested in setting up a team similar to theirs as well. Um, just reach out to us for information kind of on how we set up our team. Um, but yeah, we did have some wide reaching um, you know, views of our guide and we've had like, I can uh, kind of look up the stats. So I was able to see that people in Canada were viewing our guide and we had people kind of all over the United States view the guide. There was someone in Jordan, like the country of Jordan um, viewing our guide. So I don't know if that was spam or someone actually looking at it, <laughs> but uh, we did have a lot of wide reaching um, views and, and people using our guides and asking us if they could um, take that information and share it with their teams as well. So yeah, not only were we helping um, here at University of Chicago, but also um, abroad. And there's actually something that I realized none of us talked about. We actually were working with uh, Wuhan University as well. Um, so we did have a physician who we, ha we have a partnership with um, our hospital and their hospital at Wuhan University. So our team actually was able to give a lot of information. We had probably a good 10 questions um, a week sometimes from from that group um, 
and they would use that in preparation with this uh, weekly meeting that we were invited to sit in on at about 6 a.m. since it was with, with China. Um, but because they were actually so far ahead um, of us, about a month ahead of everything going on, um, we could see kind of what was going on there um, and talk with them. So we did do a lot of research there and we were able to share a lot of the work that our team was doing um, with those researchers over um, in China as well. So we did have some like worldwide spread of, of the team as well. Great, thank you. There was a question that came in about uh, what the website is for this, and I, I'm just asking for a little more clarification. Whether they mean about the whole project, or, uh, or maybe maybe one of you could address that already. Is there just a one place to go to that would describe this partnership? Well, we have the guide that acted like a website, um, and that. Mm -hmm. um, I can screen share if you want, or I can type it into the chat, um, but it's guides.lib.uchicago.edu slash COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. And then you'd be able to click, there's a, a tab that says for clinicians. And that's really the, the group or the page that was um, specific. And at the top of that page is really where our like team's work was. Um, so there were links on that portion that you could go to to see those different box documents. Um, our team has been kind of in hiatus. Um, probably since the summer, since the students actually um, kind of went back at, well, they either graduated or um, went back into rotations and things. So we haven't updated it um, too much since this summer, since our team hasn't been working on that. Um, but we were still getting some questions um, sent directly to Deb and I that we were able to help with, even though the students weren't with us anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I can I can share that that link in the yeah, chat. I don't I know if people can that. see that. But yeah, and then you can go in and you can see what we're working on. Um, and we're actually, we have a um, COVID-19 vaccine guide now as well too that we've worked on. And um, mm -hmm. that is something else actually that some, um, we have some students working with us now on that guide and they are creating infographics. Um, so we have one that's like frequently asked questions um, on the vaccine. And so they created an infographic on that. And um, they have ones for clinicians actually for um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that has some more information on that as well. So we've created quite a few different infographics um, with different students. So we've been able to continue um, working with medical students and finding different things for them with this team too. And there's an, another question asking if there's a website for the COVID vaccine guide. Is that a website as well? Could you maybe put that uh, link in the chat? I will put all the links in the chat. <laughs> all right, excellent, excellent. So while I'm waiting for another question to come in, Dr. Aurora, you mentioned early on, it seems like a while back now that you talked about, you ended up having to redesign some workspaces. Could you maybe just elaborate a bit on the, the kind of things that you had to do early on to redesign workspace? Um, absolutely. I, uh, I actually, for those that might not know, I have served on the board of the library and, um, and certainly am <laughs> very familiar with redesigning spaces. Um, and so thanks, Brenda, for the question. I will say that one of the things that's been probably most interesting that will, you know, maybe sustain after the pandemic is how do we do our work in the hospital? And um, I think this is for everybody. I mean, even, you know, just before this session, we were talking about how easy it is to engage people um, who might not live here in a, in a session like this, you know, um, about the library. And similarly, uh, we've noticed that uh, we, we always had this kind of, um, you know, especially when we think about learning and, you know, uh, medicine, uh, the, the prevailing notion was that we were going to have conference um, and that we were going to pull everybody off of the unit uh, and to go walk over to have a conference and then they would have their learning and then they would go back to take care of patients. Um, and what we've seen now is that a lot of that's blended, you know, where uh, with the virtual world, we have high participation in conference by our residents and our faculty, uh, but they're calling in from wherever they are. They're zooming in from wherever they are. And we've actually had to outfit spaces. So the same spaces that I described to you, um, we have outfitted with, um, 
you know, better videos. And we're still doing that right now, video cameras. Um, what's been interesting though, is initially the first thing that um, happened was we had to, unfortunately, you know, uh, close the hospital to visitors. Cause that was the very first thing, which is, you know, we, we worry that people were bringing the infection in and we needed to not only protect the workforce. I didn't think it's one thing that is not understood well during the surge is it's not just the surge of patients. It's that you're really, um, your, your surge is also the community surge. And so you're literally watching staff get sick and have to get sent home and you don't want those staff infecting other people. And so they're not getting sick in the hospital. They're members of the community and they, um, they are with their families. And if the virus is circulating at a high level in the community, they're more apt to bring it to work. And that's the challenge because then it would, they would, you know, start infecting other people. And so, um, so we have very, very strict policies now about going home when you're sick and screening. Um, but back to the work space, what's probably the most interesting is the thing that we had to co-opt first was all those patient waiting areas. So all the patient waiting areas and conference rooms, there was no more conference, right? So all of those rooms, instead of having five teams in a very cramped workroom the size of this room, you know, with a bunch of computers, um, like, you know, 20 people in a size of the room this size, we then separated all those people. So four people in a room, each at the corner, six feet apart, measuring with a computer. And so that is um, this, that's actually going on to this day so that we still have that level of um, spacing out and, and work. I don't know that we'll ever go back to what we had in exactly before, maybe, but it's, it's going to be interesting uh, because people get used to the current workflow and the work system. Um, and there's pros and cons, right? As I said, we have very high conference attendance right now. And, um, and now I think we're going to be moving into a hybrid world, which I think many of you are already thinking about, which which is what you know perhaps some people are live and then some people are are online and we've already started doing that with our medical school classes as well we have 20 medical students that are rotating into a large auditorium uh, that are um, that are uh, everyone's masked um, but they're they're at least able our first year medical students for example have never met each other you know really physically um, and so um, they're starting to have that experience again and so um, so it'll be interesting to see how things move forward but just a just a um, a, a putting a pin there to say that uh, just like we changed quickly, uh, you know, changing back won't be entirely overnight either. Yeah, excellent point. Yes, thank you. We have a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, the next one is asking if there have been other similar initiatives that have been implemented at other teaching uh, hospitals around the country. Are any of you aware of what's going on around the country? There are a few, um, Brenda. I'm, I'm struggling to remember specifically, but during when we were getting our set up, I, I believe, you know, we came across a, a couple that were doing something similar. I just, I don't have on the tip of my tongue, you know, who they are. Um, and I'm not sure how many are doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I do know, you know, when we, um, particularly Caitlin, but also the rest of us, when we are submitting um, our work to conferences and um, that sort of thing, we are getting, you know, we're, we're being accepted. And so this seems to be pretty novel for the conferences we're taking it to. Um, so I don't think it's super widespread, but we did hear of a few others that were doing something along the lines of what we were doing. Okay. Emory, um, em the Emory School of Medicine was sort of recruiting medical students to help with infographics for, for studies. So not unlike what we're doing right now with the vaccine work. Um, I would say that um, the Pritzker School of Medicine is part of the AMA accelerating um, 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 change in medical education consortium, which is a group of 30 medical schools that are funded to find value added health system roles for medical students. And so this is an example of one of those roles. And so this uh, project was actually published in a book of, of roughly 100 innovations um, during the pandemic about how students were responding to the pandemic. Um, so again, exci exciting work to highlight. Um, but I also think that this um, really the, the exciting thing will be how do we leverage some of the, what we learned and try to move it forward. Um, and uh, But part of I would say is that because we were already novel and the fact that we'd had the embedded librarian service and the partnership, we were able to pivot. And so, um, so I think some of 
of this work has been presented before at the um, National Library Conference. And so um, wanted to highlight that, you know, it's really just kind of continuing on with this partnership and then how do we kind of now bring it into the virtual world. Thank you. I'm just gonna read this next question because I love the way it's worded. So it said, can we discuss how these fabulous women leaders decided upon their careers in medicine? And I'm gonna assume that also means our two librarians too. So how about Dr. Collison, would you like to take that one first? Oh, sure. And I was um, actually, I was just thinking as I read that question, um, I think I actually thought about like a career in the library world um, also, I always kind of, so I think that it is, the skill set. it's really interesting because I think that you're kind of constantly learning. And I think that that, that is what really appealed me, appealed to me going into medicine. Um, and then I also just really like sciences. Um, I think learning, lear working with people and science and bridging that gap is like really rewarding. And I think that that's what was Honestly, probably my, not that I loved much about the pandemic, but I will say my favorite part was really working with this team because I think we were able to bring the science directly to the bedside um, quickly, which is what was needed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anyone else care to answer that question? Um, I actually started out wanting to go into medicine, so I kind of am the opposite of Maggie. Um, okay. Yeah, I even, you know, applied and interviewed at med schools and everything. Um, but I was really interested in medicine um, and then just, you know, kind of figured, you know, it wasn't actually for me to go fully into being a physician. Um, but then in looking at different careers and different things um, that I could do with kind of my background, um, I actually found more about, you know, the clinical and medical librarian position and what role that they play. Um, so I went to library school, got my master's in that, um, and then just so happened very soon after graduating to see this um, great position that opened up that was a residency um, and residency um, similar to residencies with uh, physicians, it's for newer librarians to really um, develop your skills and really get started in the profession. So my residency position was great for me as being a new graduate, but really to be able to get into um, this field and into specifically with clinical librarianship, it's a very pretty new field. It's been around since about the 70s, I believe, um, but still hasn't gotten as as big. But there are, yeah, like Emory has some, um, Yale, Northwestern. So there are different clinical and medical librarians around. Um, but this embedded position is pretty unique, um, which just really puts my two loves together. So I was very excited to get a position where I got to spend half my day um, in the library or in the in the library and then also in the hospital and going on rounds. So um, yeah, this was really a, a perfect position for me and is kind of my dream position. So I absolutely love being able to do both. So, And how fortunate we are to have you, Caitlin. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on that one? Um, I'll go next. I, um, you know, my parents are in Maryland um, and of relevance uh, to that is that I'm uh, trying to get them a vaccine and uh, also uh, have family here in Illinois. And so I would say that uh, definitely the pandemic brings you very close to what healthcare access and um, ability is like for people um, in your in where your family is and where you're from. Um, and, um, and so I grew up in Maryland. Um, my brother has spina bifida, so he's disabled. And so I kind of growing up with somebody who required a lot of care in our house, um, as well as a lot of doctor's appointments, um, I felt that a career in medicine was a way to really serve, uh, but also um, really connect with um, families and patients. And so one of the reasons I'm really passionate about things like quality and safety um, and patient experience and learning is the idea that we can do better for our patients. Um, and so I think that's been something that I have uh, seen sort of firsthand um, from being sort of a, 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 you know, part of a family, uh, family with a very, um, a, you know, patient that is in need. And so, um, so that's how I would say I ended up in medicine. Mm. Deb, you want to answer? Sure, yeah, I'll just be brief. Um, but before I do, I just want to say it has been amazing working with all of these um, these amazing women. And mm -hmm. I specifically, Caitlin has been fantastic. And I'm sure a lot of people who are attending tonight are really surprised to hear that she's a new librarian. She's so amazing and skilled and is uh, so great at what she does. Um, and so 
getting into librarianship, I think it's a little maybe a combination of some things that Caitlin said, some things that my, uh, Dr. Collison said. Um, and I was pre-med for a, a very short second. Um, I didn't take it nearly as far as Caitlin did, but I was always interested in it. And I think what drew me was like helping people, um, but also what Dr. Collison said about always learning something new. And with librarianship, you have that you're helping people and you're always learning. Um, so it's, and it, it's just very rewarding. So um, that's kind of the, the short, the short answer. Great. Fabulous answers from these fabulous women leaders. Thank you. And the last question I see so far, at least in here, is asking how this experience um, might affect what the library does about future medical challenges or those from other disciplines, even economics or physics. So I don't know from the medical perspective, Caitlin or Deb, do you want to answer that? Just I think from our experience, what we've seen is there is there's the need, right? I think the limiter is how much capacity the library has to fill that need. Um, if there were several more clinical librarians, I think there's the need for that um, and there would be work for them to do. So I guess I can't really speak to the other disciplines necessarily, but um, you know, if we are a, an example, I can imagine that in other disciplines they could do something similar. Um, but yeah, I think there, there's a lot of capacity to build more in these areas. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, did you wanna answer? Yeah, so um, kind of addressing the, the first part of that question as well, because yeah, I'm not sure how um, other disciplines would do it. Um, but with future you know, medical um, challenges, we have actually gotten some feedback um, from quite a few um, you know, physicians. Um, so I can speak from what I've heard. I, I'm sure uh, Dr. Aurora, Dr. Collison can talk more about, you know, what they've heard with their colleagues. But, you know, we've had the, the three clinicians who are um, beginning to work with us um, with the ASAP curriculum. And they've made a lot of comments about things like, I wish there was a button that we could just click to, to get librarian support right in, um, in like their documentation, everything that they do um, for that, for, for patient, um, like when they're doing their chartings and things like that like they would love to just have an easy you know librarian click button and i told them you know my email is always there you can always email me <laughs> um, but this is part of you know being that embedded librarian and being on rounds with them like i said before having that presence and having me physically there that that does get um quite a bit more and i've actually started um getting back into rounds virtually. Um, so we did kind of pause having us on rounds and we were pulled back and I've actually joined um, two new teams. So I started out with five teams um, and have tried to keep in touch with them, you know, throughout this whole time. Um, I got back in with neurology pretty much in the summer right away um, and have been, you know, rounding with them virtually. But then I've also joined um, uh, our liver team. So I, I work with them now and then um, CCP, which, Dr. Aurora Collison will have to remind me what that means again. <laughs> um, but that that is a team that I have recently started and they easily send me at least two to three questions every time that I'm in there, which um, is actually quite a, quite a few. Um, most of the time you'll get like one or two questions, but the first time I was with them, I think they gave me five questions. Um, so they put me to work right away. <laughs> uh, but we really do see, um, you know, with more of a presence of the librarians being there, they are really um, starting to utilize us a lot more. And, and like I said, building that relationship with them. Um, but I do think this is, you know, letting us see things like creating this ASAP elective now. Um, we are seeing a lot more use in, in using the library. And with this team, people have seen what the library and what librarians can do for them. Uh, so I think that has really just helped bring people's awareness to it. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll get a lot more more use from me and Deb, which I'm all I, I would love to, you know, give, give me more questions. I don't know about I think Deb's workload is pretty full, but I would love to, you know, continue, continue getting to work. I'll just sort of add a little bit from my university librarian perspective. Um, we've talked about this in several groups in the library. Um, I think this past year has put a tremendous spotlight on the library. I think people are now seeing some of the things that we know we've been doing for many years in some cases, but maybe the the community, the campus didn't realize that we had this expertise or we were offering these types of services. And now they, when they really needed them, they were there. And um, as, as Dr. Aurora said, we were able to pivot and offer those services and make them available to people in a way that they now recognize that skill set. So you two are perfect examples of 
building on something, the embedded librarian, the rounding, all of that, building on it to create something more. So that, that analogy could apply to any of our disciplines, building on things that we're already doing, um, but also taking this year and looking back on it and saying, well, what were those things that um, our students and faculty weren't aware of, they are now, that they really, really appreciate because those are the things that probably are the most important and we might wanna develop further and we might, might want to build on. So I think we've learned a whole lot from this past year. We all have obviously in many, many ways, but so you, you provided a wonderful example of what to do in terms of building on our strengths. So I'm looking at the clock and I've been given the marching orders that I'm supposed to, you know, so keep us in time. And I, I want to thank all of you again so much for your presentations and answering your questions. It was really, really interesting. And I want to thank our audience for joining us tonight. I, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So many thanks to everyone. And uh, hopefully you have a good night and uh, we'll see you again in another future event. Thanks, everybody. Good night.